This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. We talk naval aviation with author and historian Hill Goodspeed on this edition of Conversations. Hill Goodspeed is an expert in the history of naval aviation. For two decades, he's been a historian and artifact collection manager at one of the premier aviation museums in the world, the National Naval Aviation Museum on board Naval Air Station, Pensacola, Florida. In addition, Goodspeed is an author and adjunct professor. He teaches strategy and policy for the Naval War College's distance education program. He has authored or edited five books on topics ranging from naval aviation to skylines around the world. His articles have been published by national magazines and his expertise and commentary have been utilized by the likes of the History Channel, PBS, and the Discovery Channel. We're pleased to have Hill Goodspeed on this edition of Conversations. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Why the interest in naval aviation? Well, it goes way back, I guess. Uh, my grandfather, uh, like many young men of his generation, came down to Pensacola in 1940 from Joliet, Illinois, and uh, responded to the aviation cadet program, which allowed uh, college graduates to come down and uh, learn to fly. And so that's what he did. He got his wings here in uh, September of 1941 and stayed on as an instructor. And uh, like Pensacola is called the mother-in-law of the Navy. So like many others of his contemporaries, he married a a local girl and uh, settled here after the war and uh, hence uh, really that was my interest and uh, my father uh, became a marine officer uh, during the Vietnam War era so military history has always been an interest of mine so and just naturally you know when the opportunity opened up at the Naval Aviation Museum to work there it just uh, really fit right in. I bet you heard a lot of great stories from grandpa growing up huh? Actually, uh, unfortunately, I didn't, but he died relatively young, oh, okay. um, and uh, that's it. I guess uh, a lot of the World War II veterans I've met at uh, the museum have sort of filled in as far as telling stories, but uh, I was a teenager when he died, and it was before yeah. I really gained too much of an interest as, as, like I have now, and right. so I, that's one of my regrets. I wish I'd been able to talk to him a little bit more, but uh, he's definitely an inspiration. His uh, World War II uh, picture complete with his flight goggles and leather helmet. It's on the wall of my office, so uh, he, he uh, really still means a lot to me. What's it like as you get the opportunity to interact with some of these World War II veterans? It's really an incredible experience, and um, particularly now when they're when they're passing away at an alarming rate. I mean, we've just in the past couple of days we've had a couple of real giants in naval aviation history pass away uh, from the World War II era, and so I. I really, you know, cherish the opportunities to talk to them because they they just relay experiences of a, just a momentous time in our history, and um, it, it's just it's a unique opportunity, and it's always a privilege and an honor whenever you get the chance to to talk to them and, and just hear what they endured and went through and and uh, all the sacrifices that they made. Yeah. Well, well, just as a layman, I, it, it, it's a great experience to talk to them. But I can imagine as a historian that you really have a deep appreciation for what they're what they're you saying. You do because you, you, I've had the opportunity to read, uh, you know, firsthand accounts, maybe letters that were written during a particular battle, or read the action report from a World War II engagement where you can really read the official record of what went on, and then you get the chance to to speak with them and uh, take that official record and and, and humanize it because you hear what happened to them. I mean, there's one guy I always like to tell the story his name was uh, Don Cruz and um, he in the post-war years became a weather officer so he would uh, chart weather patterns and everything and he all he did was talk about that that was his favorite thing he just loved talking about the hurricanes he used to track and everything and I had served in World War II and so I asked him well you know Don what what did you do in World War II and he said well I served aboard uh, the USS Wasp which was a, a carrier that was sunk at Guadalcanal and I, you know, I, I, he'd never talked about that before, so I, I interviewed him about that, and, and I said, well, what, he described his harrowing experiences, and I said, well, what did you do after that? And he goes, well, I went to another carrier, the USS Liscombe Bay, which was sunk in the Gilbert Islands. So here you have a man who had been so silent about his World War II service telling me about swimming away from two carriers, uh, which wow. was, uh, so that, that's the type of experience uh, um, I've had there, the experiences I've had there really have been of that nature. You just never know the, the tremendous uh, stories you're going to hear. You know, they're known as the greatest generation. I'm curious, as you've interviewed these uh, guys over time, what, what have you taken away from it just from a personal standpoint? Well, um, I guess it would be you realize how young they were. Yeah. And that is the thing that really boggles my mind. Whether it's in the museum library, we'll get a donation of a, a letters or diary written by somebody, and you realize that 
you know, they were only 20, 21 years old. And um, I guess the, the greatest example of that, we had a gentleman named uh, Arthur Ray Hawkins, Captain uh, Ray Hawkins, who worked at our museum foundation for many years. And he was there when I got there. And he had had the experience of uh, not only later in life did he become a Blue Angel pilot and Blue Angel flight leader, but during World War II, he became the Navy's 10th ranking ace and he sank a Japanese battleship and received three Navy crosses, which was right below the Medal of Honor. And he did that all before he was 21 years old. And wow. I think about what I could have done it before I was 21 years old, and it, it's a far cry from that. So that, that's what I take away most from all veterans, really. I mean, because you know, all the, the aviators and air crewmen, sailors that I've talked to, you just realize how young uh, they are and on the front lines today is the same case, same instance, and, and, and what they're asked to do. And that, that's really what's, uh, what sticks out when I speak with them, what amazes me the most. In your judgment, what makes a good naval aviator? Well, I think um, the ones I've met, uh, there has to be a certain degree of adventure uh, and because it is uh, something that it's not your standard uh, operating job, right. standard job. Right. Right. And it has to be a passion uh, for, for flying. Um, you have to have certainly a degree of nerve, uh, particularly, uh, and, but a calmness and coolness right. about you, particularly operating aboard a ship. I mean, they, you know, landing an aircraft in a moving ship is still the most challenging thing you do in, in aviation. From and, um, and just, I think you also have to have a sense of camaraderie because, you know, if you look in the aviation community and you, you, you're around naval aviation, you realize it's a very tight-knit group. Right. And um, they, they uh, you know, they relate to one another. They, up, they hold each other to very high standards within squadrons. And uh, so I think that's a, a, an aspect of it as well. And, you know, you can look at most visit people here in Pensacola, you can look, go see the Blue Angels. And that's an epitome of that camaraderie. It's just an extension of what's in the fleet, uh, what they do. How did naval aviation first come about? Well, it came about really uh, in uh, 1910 was a signature moment in naval aviation because there was an aircraft manufacturer named Glenn Curtis. And Curtis was specialized in the development of seaplanes. And he wanted to adapt those seaplanes to use with the Navy, obviously, because they flew from water. But he had trouble convincing the Navy. Because you have to remember, the Navy at that time was uh, wedded to the battleship, these you know giant vessels with these big guns. And if you look at the aircraft, you go to the museum, you see these wooden fabric biplanes. You know, no naval officer would say that's really going to impact naval warfare. I mean, <laughs> it, uh, so anyway, the, he had to come up with an idea on how to interest the Navy. And so what he did is, was uh, he enlisted a, a, a civilian pilot, a guy from Iowa named Eugene Ely, which is I always find ironic. He was Ely from Iowa, as far away from the ocean as you can get. <laughs> and he's the one that made these landmark flights. The first was in November of 1910 when he successfully took off from a ship. Uh, they built this makeshift wooden flight deck on a cruiser. And then in January of 1911, he successfully landed on a ship. And it was an interesting uh, operation. He had these little uh, hooks that were um, between the wheels, on the axle of the wheels. And they had put sandbags and ropes. So they had these ropes across this wooden deck and sandbags on each end of the ropes. And that was the primitive arresting gear that stopped him when he landed. So that convinced the Navy to appropriate the grand sum of $25,000 to purchase a couple of aircraft and start training uh, the, the first aviators. And from that, we get uh, what we have today. Wow. I can only imagine. I mean, taking off from an aircraft carrier, but landing is, I can only imagine what must have been going through his mind the first time you do something. Oh, right. I mean, and he had just, you know, it was, uh, there was, it, it was unheard of what yeah. he was doing. And, uh, but today you even, you ask a, a carrier pilot today, um, what what is the most challenging and it is making that carrier landing and during the Vietnam War they did a it was a study that's uh, been publicized before they wanted to gauge the stress level of uh, naval aviators and uh, during the course of a combat mission and so they had them wired up with all these uh, measuring devices and the highest stress level exceeding combat getting fired at was landing their plane on a ship at night and uh, yeah. that uh, that uh, so that that speaks volumes about uh, you know what it takes to perform that very uh, very demanding uh, evolution. Well, I, I can only imagine. I mean, knowing a little bit about flying mm -hmm. airplanes, I can only imagine you just have the utmost respect, and and then you throw weather in on exactly. top of it. And, oh, mean, exactly. You just realize how amazing those guys. It, it, it is uh, a, those, it those definitely guys. a unique breed. <laughs> <laughs> they truly are. <laughs> anyway, um, how has or, 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 or I guess, what has been the biggest thing that has influenced naval aviation over its lifespan? 
Well, I would say it is, um, certainly from a technological standpoint, it is the aircraft carrier. I mean, since 1922, which is the first um, aircraft carrier when it was first commissioned, USS Langley, and um, to today with the modern uh, nuclear-powered vessels. I mean, that certainly has shaped uh, you know, naval aviation and very much the Navy. I mean, the Navy is, uh, when there's a famous uh, quote that's always made in relation to naval aviation, it's whenever there's a crisis in the world, the president always asks, where's the nearest aircraft carrier? And so certainly that is something that, that rings true and it's, it's been the case for decades. And I think also what has been, you know, it, it, what's made naval aviation so important for the country is the fact that we're a, a maritime nation. I mean, we always have been. We're surrounded on two sides by ocean. Most of our, uh, and most of the goods that come into the country, most of exports and imports are, you know, by way of the sea. So, um, and naval aviation is part of that naval force that preserves those vital lifelines. So. Um, any idea how things will change in the future as you have the, the drones and what's what's that look well, like? Well, I think uh, drones are going to play an increasing role in uh, in naval aviation operations and certainly any air operations. I mean, they've demonstrated their capability. and uh, But I think that you're still going to see a place for manned aircraft because there are certain types of missions and for example, like a search and rescue type mission right, to right. go in and, and, and rescue a downed pilot or to, to extract a, a, an infantry squad or platoon from a dangerous situation. That human dimension is, is going to be necessary because that is a, a mission that, you know, the parameters may change on a, on a moment's notice. And, um, and I think that's going to be needed. So I think there's still going to be a place for manned aircraft, but, but certainly uh, the face of naval aviation is going to change in the coming years. It's interesting, very fascinating. Now you're at the Naval Aviation Museum on board Pensacola Naval Air Station. How did Pensacola become such a, a hotbed for naval aviation? Well, it all goes back to um, 1914, really 1913. And uh, the Navy, prior to that time, the Navy ordered its first aircraft in 1911. And for the ensuing couple of years, naval aviation really didn't have a home. Mm -hmm. They would, uh, during the winter, they'd pack up all the aircraft, which didn't consist of much, and the personnel, and they'd uh, go join the fleet uh, off Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and that's where they'd do the winter maneuvers at that time. And during um, the warmer weather months, they actually had a base um, across the Severn River for the Naval Academy. And so really they were just looking, it was a vagabond existence for naval aviation, and they said, okay, we need to develop a center of aviation training and a place where naval aviation can call home. And so they set about looking for places, and uh, they settled on Pensacola for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which was the weather. You know, like a, like it's generally year-round flying weather here. Right, right. And uh, also, they needed a uh, place that had some infrastructure. And Pensacola had had a navy yard since the 1800s, so there was there were buildings here that didn't have to construct a lot of things. And also, the main thing was uh, seaplanes were what naval aviation was about at that time. And so they needed a runway for seaplanes, a protected body of water, and there you had Pensacola Bay. So that's why they chose it. And uh, so January of 1914, they first arrived, and that's uh, that's what became that's how Pensacola became the cradle of naval aviation. Interesting. Um, as as you have watched and, and viewed people coming through, who who is the most sort of famous person that's been through the, the naval aviation training. And, and oh gosh, it's it's tough to tell. I mean, it'd be really hard to pinpoint somebody. I mean, certainly if you're, from, if you're in a political realm, it's George H.W. Bush, right. who was a naval aviator. If you're a sports fan, it's uh, Ted Williams, who was a Boston Red Sox slugger who, who became a naval aviator. If uh, if you're into space, a lot of the early astronauts <laughs> went through here. So, and, and even in Hollywood, you know, Tyrone Power, the Hollywood actor from the uh, 40s and 50s and 30s came came through here, and uh, so it's uh, it's it's tough to pinpoint somebody, um, but that there is there's a great range of people who went on to become very uh, successful in other endeavors that really uh, got their start as young men um, in naval aviation. Now you have the airplane that George H. W. Bush. We have three presidential aircraft, right? Okay. And um, um, normally the presidential transport um, is on long distance travel is, is Air Force One, but we have a Marine One, which is the helicopter okay. the president uh, uses uh, to, to fly from the White House to on short distances. And so we have a Marine One helicopter that flew Presidents uh, Nixon and Ford. And then we have two aircraft that are uh, sort of unique in their relations to presidents, uh, one of which is a uh, N2S Stearman trainer. It's a, a biplane, and that was used as a primary trainer during World War II. 
and um, we tracked it down uh, when George H.W. Bush was a vice president looking for a plane that he may have flown. And all aviators, as, as you know, as a pilot, keep uh, logbooks, right. and they right. note uh, when they flew, what number plane they flew. And so we had copies of uh, President Bush's logbook, and he, we searched uh, the civilian market and found that uh, this aircraft was a crop duster. And it had <laughs> one he had flown uh, twice during his training at uh, NES, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the dead of winter, so it was definitely some chilly flights. <laughs> and then we also have the uh, famous aircraft that um, uh, President George W. Bush, his son, made the land his carrier landing in on board the USS Abraham Lincoln, where he gave that famous mission accomplished speech. Okay. This was the plane Navy One, which okay. uh, he actually um, uh, was on board when they made that landing. And it's sort of humorous when uh, a friend of mine was talking to one of the pilots that actually made the landing was the pilot on the aircraft. And naturally, when you have the, he's never flown the president before. You had the president of the United States sitting right there. And uh, I guess President Bush sensed he was a little nervous, so he tapped, uh, tapped him on the shoulder and said, don't worry, Commander, I have a great vice president. <laughs> <laughs> Good sense of humor. Now, is the helicopter, is that the one that, that Nixon's on? Uh, it is not. Okay. Um, actually, at that time, the N Marines and the Army shared responsibility for helicopter transport. And uh, now it's exclusively the Marine Corps that okay. does it. And okay. so it was actually an Army uh, helicopter that, uh, that Nixon waved from and gave his final farewell to on the White House lawn. Interesting. That's, that's very interesting. Pensacola synonymous for the Blue Angels. How did the Blue Angels come about? It uh, came about really right after World War II. Um, it was a period of tremendous drawdown in the military was uh, was going on. And uh, Fleet Admiral, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, who was the Chief of Naval Operations, wanted to um, put together a demonstration team for two reasons, one of which was to demonstrate to the American public what naval aviation had accomplished in World War II, but also keep naval aviation's capabilities in, in the public eye as well to benefit the Navy as it was proceeding forward into the post-war years, which were really uncertain as far as what role the Navy was going to play. You had the nuclear weapons that had been introduced during World War II. So, and that's how they got started. Okay. And really started out over 1946 over at uh, Naval Air Station Jacksonville. Okay. And, and what type of aircraft were they using? Uh, they initially? flew the F-6F Hellcat, which had been the Navy's frontline fighter uh, during the latter part of World War II. Okay. And of course, that would have been a, a prop. It was a prop-driven prop aircraft, and then right, right after that, they flew the F-8F Bearcat, which was another propeller-driven aircraft, and then they transitioned in, into jets, and they've been in jets ever since. Okay. Uh, you could only imagine, is, is there video out there of, of the old uh, There are there's some video footage planes. of the old propeller aircraft doing yeah. some of the air shows, and it, it's definitely the air shows, if you look at them, they're, <laughs> you know, your typical grainy video, and, yeah. and it's definitely not the... Um, you know the the orchestrated air show experience that you have now, complete with the you know the, the music, the announcers, and everything like that. It was de okay. definitely much more of a uh, a primitive affair as far as air shows. But what's common denominator? You can see the crowds, everybody staring up, you know, with their hands uh, shielding from the sun, looking up and seeing what they're doing. So that thing hasn't changed as far as uh, air shows are concerned. Uh, well, wow. Now, when you get something for the museum. How, what is that process? How do you find out about it? And what's the process till it gets to the museum? Well, um, as far as it depends. If it's an aircraft, there are a lot of avenues that we, you know, when, if an aircraft is being retired from active service, the museum can say, okay, we don't have this particular type of aircraft in the collection, so we'd like to make it part of the collection. So the Navy will actually earmark that plane for us, and in many cases, they'll flight deliver them. So. For example, the F-14 Tomcat, which is just a, a very famous fighter of the latter part of the 20th century into the early 21st century, uh, was actually flown to us, and it, it was the last one to fly a combat mission uh, over the skies of Iraq, and then its last flight was actually to the museum. And so we have that occasion come about. Now, we have private individuals who will um, actually donate aircraft to us. So, for example, we'll, you know, a lot of aircraft, have military aircraft, have been used in the firefighting. You know, they'll use, they're used as aerial tankers to, to extinguish firefights or fire, forest fires in the Northwest. And so some of those have been flown to us, and those are ones that come from private donors. Um, we've actually pulled a number of them from Lake Michigan, which is uh, when a lot of people ask, you know, why do you have aircraft from Lake Michigan? Uh, the Navy had two training aircraft carriers there during World War II, and that's where all, or most all, naval aviators went to learn to fly from a ship. And uh, naturally, there were accidents, and so there are a number of wrecks on the bottom of Lake Michigan, which we've been able to uh, pull up from the depths and, and make part of the museum collection. And there's some real neat ones in there. There's combat veterans 
uh, aircraft that weren't thought to exist anywhere in the world, but they were in what we call underwater storage for, for many years. <laughs> wow. So And so that's how aircraft get to us primarily. So, so you would bring that to the museum and then start the refurbishing that's process? That's right, uh, we had restoration, we have a restoration shop in the back, just really skilled artisans and, and uh, there's been neat stories that have come about from those restoration efforts, like they will clean a battery, for example, from an aircraft that had been underwater for 50 years and it'll still hold a charge. And really? um, it, there's still air in the tires and, and some of those things. And you really think that, you know, when you bring these aircraft up, I mean, it's really like a, like an archeological site. I mean, they haven't been touched since they went into the water in 1945 or 44 or what have you. And we had one instance, there was a World War II veteran out there, a volunteer named Burl Sumner, who was a Marine enlisted pilot and then uh, spent a whole career in the Marine Corps. And uh, he's restoring an aircraft that was pulled up from Lake Michigan. It's one of the first ones we pulled up and he checked his logbook and he'd flown it about two or three days before it ditched in the, in wow. the lake. So I mean, that was a neat experience for him to see an aircraft that, that he'd flown. And uh, then we have small artifacts that come and they come from various, uh, in various ways. You know, sometimes we'll, they'll be in a state sale or something and we'll, our foundation will provide funding to purchase them for us and donate them to the museum. But a lot of times it's just people walking in the door and you know, found something in their grandfather's trunk and, uh, and brought it to us. Uh, probably the um, neatest story that I've had in connection to an artifact coming in or some papers was um, there was a gentleman who, who uh, worked as a Navy reservist here. He'd come down here for his two weeks of annual training at Naval Hospital Pensacola. He's from a place in Michigan. And um, he, a coworker of his up there said, look, I just bought this old house and I found this box of stuff and I know you're in the Navy and you'll find a good home for it. And he looked through it and he saw instantly what it was and what, how amazing it was. And he brought it down to us and donated it to the museum. And what it was, was evidently this home had been, had been owned by the family of a sailor who had uh, been killed in action on board the USS Indianapolis, which was that famous uh, the ship that sank after it was, uh, was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine, sank in minutes. And um, the local student here, Hunter Scott, the one who did his uh, project, the History Fair project, right, right. and uh, has gone into you know, greater heights than the History Fair project with relation to that story. It, it was the original telegrams that were sent to his, uh, his parents saying he was missing in action and killed in action. And also the letter from the captain, Captain McVeigh. And you look at that letter and it's, it's a letter of condolence and you really realize he had to assign over 700 of those letters. And it just really, that's what hit home to me the yeah. instant I read it was just the, the burden it must have uh, been as a commanding officer to do that. So that's the, that's the type of stories, that's the neat thing at the museum. You never know what's going to show up and it's almost like being a kid at Christmas. If you're a historian like me, it's like a kid at Christmas every day. And um, as the historian Stephen Ambrose talked about, you know, as a historian you get to read, it's like reading someone else's mail. I mean, you, that's what, pretty much yeah, what you do yeah. a lot. You just get all these stories from reading things that people have written or, or handling artifacts that they've worn. And that's, uh, it's, it's, it's a neat job for a, for a history buff and, uh, like me. I can, I can imagine. Now you have several books out there I want to talk about. One on naval aviation. Kind of give me the synopsis of that. Sure. Um, there was a, that's really uh, my second book. The first one I did was just uh, focusing on the museum's aircraft collection. But this one was, uh, the genesis behind it was a small company, a publishing company in Connecticut uh, that came up with the idea to highlight the armed forces or e elements of the armed forces in a way that had not been done before in this, in a large format, uh, great sharp photography, and, uh, and text describing the essence of that service. And the first one they did was the Marines, which was highly successful. And uh, then they did one in the Navy and Naval Aviation was, I believe, the third one they did. And uh, so I was uh, fortunate enough to get the opportunity to be the editor in chief. So I was able to write a few of the chapters, uh, get uh, authors to help other w in the other chapters and write them and, and pick the photography. And it really was the whole purpose was just to be a celebration of Naval Aviation, its history and also its current operations. So that was, uh, uh, that was a, a very fun book to do, particularly since uh, the job I have. Yeah, and uh, it, it, was, it was a real, a real way to take the knowledge I've been fortunate to gain over the years working at the museum and, and be able to, to present it in a book like that. You also did some writing about skylines, both in the U.S. and around the world. How did that come uh, That came about from that company. Actually, I did some work uh, for them uh, doing a naval aviation book and also one on uh, a chronology of the U.S. Navy. And then they had this other op uh, idea, which was to present American cities in this same format of a large-scale coffee table type book 
with these brilliant panoramic images. So I was chosen to, to write the text for those. And uh, really that was a neat, those were probably the most enjoyable ones, I guess, because the others with the Navy, it wasn't as new as those topics were. Those, uh, like each city I wrote about was a, you know, it was a really a voyage of discovery as far as writing is concerned, just to uh, really, you know, d discover the essence of those cities and, and summarize them in 500 words or less, which is a challenge, <laughs> and uh, just uh, to, to capture uh, the essence of these cities, not only in the United States, uh, but around the world, and uh, they were they were fun books to do. Any big surprises come out of it that just you go, wow? I'd... Well, I'd say for, uh, most in some cities I had not really explored that much. I mean, certainly with London and Paris and those uh, recognizable cities, um, you you think you've you've read enough about them to know the essence of them. But if you get into some of some of the other cities um, that had not really come across my attention, I can't really remember any of them right now. But uh, but yes, there's some neat neat side facts about them that you that you wouldn't think of. Getting, getting short on time here, anything that we need to be looking forward to as far as the National Museum of Naval Aviation is uh, concerned? Uh, definitely. Um, this is actually the 50th anniversary of the museum. Um, the museum opened in June 1963. So uh, this all throughout this year, we're going to try to do some exhibits and some, some stuff on our website and our Facebook page, which highlights you know what we've done over the past 50 years. And uh, we just... Uh, are really putting the finishing touches and on some of the elements of a women in naval aviation exhibit mm. which we're going to open this year as well uh, 1973 40 years ago um, this year was when the first female naval aviators reported for training uh, here at pensacola so um, it's a it's a an, an exhibit's going to explore that entire uh, dimension of the experience of uh, women in naval aviation and how their role has evolved and uh, right before i came here today as a matter of fact we had the first uh, members of the first all-female combat air crew of an E-2 Hawkeye. Uh, and they were actually, they flew down on a cross country and did some interviews with us. Uh, that's, and that's gonna be featured in the, in the exhibit. So uh, that, it's gonna be an exciting one. I really have an exciting multimedia aspect of it with some short historical films and also clips from these interviews that we've done with some real, some real neat, uh, neat people who really have uh, have seen a lot and done a lot in naval aviation in the modern era. So I think it'll be real exciting for visitors. Fascinating, fascinating. The website is? It's www.navalaviationmuseum.org. Okay. And there you'll find all the happenings and goings on and can look, at, explore our collections and do all sorts of stuff on the website. Fascinating. And the museum is open, what, virtually all year? It is. We're only closed three days a year, um, which is Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's Day. And uh, we're open nine to five and we, Urge everybody in the local community and around the country, around the world, to come come visit us. It's a great place. Hill Goodspeed, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank, thank you, you so very much. Enjoy Appreciate being here. Our pleasure to have you, Hill Goodspeed. By the way, you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org/conversations. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.